My name is Lindsay Cornish. I am the head brewer and part owner of 3-4 Beer Company in Fort Collins, Colorado. I'm passionate about stouts because they're a phenomenal beer that you can drink year round and I am determined to make stouts year round that people want to drink regardless of it's, if it's below zero or 98 degrees outside. So I'm trying to teach people to do the same. We do lots of different varieties. One of the great things that we can offer here is um, a full brew pub. So we have beer from other friends in the brewing industry. So I get to play with beer and serve that and also enjoy beers that everybody else has made as well. I originally started, as many of us have, as a home brewer, got involved with the CSU brewing program and then worked for Odell Brewing Company in Fort Collins for about four years and then helped Horse and Dragon get on their feet and was the head brewer there for four years before taking this new spot over. Some of the major stout influences that I've had are Lujin Milk Stout over at Odell Brewing. Um, I was a part of all of the test batches to get that guy out and rolling. And then at Horse and Dragon Brewing, I created Sad Panda, which is a coffee vanilla stout that has become quite popular in the Colorados. 3-4 is just a little spot right uh, off campus in Fort Collins and we're trying to create a really unique environment in that area for adults and families um, and have a unique experience with art and sculpture um, as well as art and beer. Right now, you can get our beer just in our brew pub in Fort Collins. Our future plans here are just to keep growing this community and being able to create a very niche brew pub um, in a neighborhood that doesn't really have one and expand our beer selection. In the past, uh, I haven't gotten to play with as many beer styles because I was more focused on distribution. And now here we can experiment a little more and have a better relationship with each person that we're serving a pint to. Well, today we're going to talk about brewing stouts. And to start with that, we need to know where we came from and where these styles came from. So really all stouts came from porters and porters were brewed in London, England, and in 1817, uh, the roasting kiln was developed so that more and more of these beers could be developed. And what was happening is there were lighter porters being brewed, pale porters, and then stout porters, which were stronger in alcohol and a little heavier. And as generally goes with um, language, we start to drop parts of the names. And so a stout really became a strong porter. And then developed into many, many different varieties. So we've got five traditional stout varieties that are recognized. There's a few more out there, but we're primarily going to focus on these today. We've got our dry Irish stout, our sweet or milk stout, oatmeal stouts, foreign or extra stouts, and imperial stouts. And I'm going to go through each of those to give you a little bit of history and more information about them. So as you're deciding what type of stouts you want to build, you have those in mind. So we're going to start with dry Irish stouts. These came from people in England actually trying to dodge the malt tax bill. Unmart unmalted barley was not taxed the same as roasted malted barley. So they switched things up a bit. Roasting that unmalted barley gave a more sharp coffee-like bitterness to the stouts that is very indicative of those dry Irish stouts. So this was a way uh, to continue to make those beers but not be taxed, which eventually did catch up with everybody. So Irish stouts tend to be a little bit more roasty and have a little bit higher hop bitterness and a very thin, creamy, drinkable body. A lot of times when people think of these beers, they immediately go to Guinness. People often ask me if Irish stouts started in Britain, why they ended up declining there and became very, very popular in Ireland. And the primary reason is that in World War I, there were energy restrictions and people were unable to roast the malt there. In Ireland, they did not face those restrictions. And so they were able to continue to produce that roasted malt. It also lent for an affinity to charms of the lucky variety and tiny green hats. That last part was a lie. Don't listen to that. 
So then we've got our sweet milk stouts, which contain lactose sugar. So that is a milk sugar. These stouts tend to be sweeter, have a little bit heavier body. They were actually brewed to be a nutritious stout. Um, in the times that some of these beers were becoming more popular, tinctures and health tonics were very popular. And this was a way to create a beer that was sweeter, so a little bit easier to drink, and also had a lot of energy giving calories from that unfermented milk sugar. The next variety that's pretty popular is oatmeal stouts, also brewed to be a nutritious stout. This was really a, a marketing campaign to sell more oats. It gives a lot of nutty, creamy characteristics to a beer and is sweet and creamy but without that lactose sugar that is in milk stouts. Foreign and extra stouts are a stout variety that were originally brewed as very strong stouts or strong porters. And be, due to taxing and other economical issues, they became a high-end luxury item. And because of that, they were then exported to many different countries, which is where that foreign stout name came from that originally started as an extra stout. And our last variety is imperial stouts. These stouts have a much higher ABV and were originally brewed to handle the long travel times um, overseas to other countries and used to be cast conditioned quite often, had sherry-like characteristics that we've gotten away from now, but still come through with some of those high ABV imperial stouts. So we're going to move into the malt varieties that are generally used in stouts so that you can try to piece together what you're looking for in your own stout. Generally, stouts start with two-row barley. It's clean, it's highly attenuative, so you can get all of the sugar that you need out of it. It's very efficient. From there, we need to create those typical characteristics you're looking for in a stout. The roast, the chocolate, the toffee, caramel, sometimes even a little fruity. And so let's talk about the malts that can provide you those characteristics. We'll start with roasted malt and roasted barley. They are actually different things. So this again came from that historical issue of evading the malt tax. Roasted barley has less of the Maillard reaction going on than roasted malt does. So you tend to get a little less sharpness and a thicker, denser white head. Whereas if you're using roasted malted barley, it's going to give you more of those coffee sharp characteristics and a darker head. Generally, the roasted barley is what I prefer in stouts and roasted malt is what I prefer in porters because of that difference between sharpness. So chocolate malt is our next dark malt. It is technically a lighter roasted malt. However, it is still very, very dark on the spectrum. Chocolate malt's going to give you a little less of that sharp coffee characteristic and a little bit more of the chocolate roast. I very much like this malt in stouts, sweet stouts and American stouts to give it a little bit more complexity than just using roast alone. Roast alone is great for Irish stouts. A mixture of roast and chocolate can give you a much bigger depth of flavor. A newer dark malt on the scene is Midnight Wheat. And this is a white wheat malt that's actually been roasted. The benefit to using this type of roasted malt is that wheat is not going to have that husk, which provides a lot of that tannic bitterness. So you get a lot of dark color, but without all of that sharpness. So it's a great way to make a sweet stout very dark without much bitterness and lending into other malts that don't provide very much bitterness. There are de-husk roasted malts. Uh, Wireman is a fantastic source for that. Their Carafa varieties are dark malts that have removed the husk, so you don't get a lot of that tannic sharpness and you get more of that coffee chocolate characteristic and a little less bitterness in your brew. I am a big fan of mixing up my malts and using caramel and crystal malts in my stouts as well. I think that it gives you some more fruity caramel toffee characteristics that can really add to a stout instead of just primarily having 
that roast chocolate bitterness. The caramel and crystal malts will also lend to a sweeter flavor, so it's a perfect addition to sweeter stouts, American stouts, pretty much anything other than a dry Irish stout, I would recommend using them in. They also can give a nice ruby red hue to a stout if it's ever held up to a light and it's not too dark. I tend to use these specialty malts in a 10 to 30% range of my malt bill. I usually stick to the uh, 20 to 30% if I'm using some of those other malts that are not my dark malts, my caramel malts, flaked barley, flaked oats, things like that. If I'm just doing a traditional Irish stout that's just roasted barley, uh, pale two row, I will be closer to the 10% range. So what we're looking at here is some of the malts that we would use. Right here we've got our pale two row malt. This is going to be the base of our beer, a very clean fermenting, highly attenuative malt that makes a great base for a dark beer. We've got some of our darker caramelized crystallized malts. This is a Cara Aroma from Wireman that's an absolutely fantastic malt where we're getting some of that sugar caramelized into a fantastic product that's going to give you not only a little bit of color, but a depth of flavor in caramel, toffee, fruity notes. Here is our traditional chocolate malt, highly roasted. You're going to get a lot of those roasty, bitter, kilned malt characteristics, but a fantastic addition to your traditional roasted malt. Over here we've got the lightly crystallized malt. This is where you're going to get a little bit more of those sugars, some more body, and a depth of flavor with some of those fruity characteristics as opposed to just doing primarily those roasted malts. I threw in some wheat here at the bottom. We really didn't talk about it that much, but wheat, dextrin malt, flaked barley, flaked oats, can give you a body that will support some of those roasty characteristics and the all-important chocolate chips in a chocolate malted beer. So here are some examples of stouts that I have brewed in some of the different varieties to give you an idea of where I put some of these different malts. On top of malt, there are other adjuncts that we can add to our stouts to give us more flavor, variety, and different mouthfeel. Adjuncts are anything that you're adding to your beer that you're going to receive sugar from, but is not a malted product. So primarily, we're talking about rice, corn, flaked barley, oats, sugar, honey, and there are two different varieties. Anything that's added to your mash is a starch that needs to be converted to sugar and anything that's added to your boil is a sugar that's already going to be available for your yeast. So our mashable adjuncts that we're adding in stouts are things like flaked barley, uh, flaked oats. These are going to provide you with a creamier mouthfeel, a little bit of nutty characteristic because they haven't been malted they do not have the enzymes within themselves because they haven't been malted to convert that starch to sugar. So you do have to rely on the rest of your mash to do so. They can also cause some issues with gelatinization uh, because they haven't been malted. So I tend to keep these to about 3% maximum of my total malt bill. And I add them in a very specific way as well. After I'm finished mashing in all of my grains, I will add these to the top of the mash and just gently stir them in to make sure that they're all moistened without mixing them too deep into the mash bed so that you prevent stuck mashes.
So now we're going to get into specialty ingredients that can be added. Lactose is obviously a huge one. This is where you're getting all of your milk or sweet stouts. As I said before, it is a milk sugar that's being added. That is a complex sugar that your yeast cannot break down. So what you're giving to your beer is a sweetness that will always remain. Regardless of how attenuative your yeast is, that sugar will stay in solution and give you a more creamy mouthfeel. One thing to keep in mind, it is not safe for lactose intolerant people to eat this and not have an issue. So something to warn your uh, customers about if they ask. Chocolate is another ingredient that's added to stouts quite often. I am very partial to it because there's a lot of different ways that you can add chocolate and the things that make chocolate to your beer. Chocolate as chips can be added, cocoa powder can be added, nibs, as well as the husks from that cocoa bean. All of them can be added in different ways. We'll talk a little bit more about where I prefer to do that. But the chocolate, the nibs, all of that gives a depth of flavor that you can't really get from your malt and really enhances the experience if you're looking for chocolate, which doesn't necessarily have to be sweet. Dark chocolate tends to be quite bitter. The nibs will add bitterness as well. They're just going to give you a little boost into that round characteristic. There's lots of other spices and options that you can add to stouts that definitely get out of Reinheitsgebot. We've already talked about some of those, um, but the sky's the limit when it comes to this. Vanilla is another fantastic addition, especially if you're trying to boost the perception of chocolate in a beer, milk chocolate has quite a bit of vanilla in it. And people perceive that milk chocolate characteristic to have that flavor. And so by adding just a little bit of vanilla to a stout, I usually prefer in secondary, you can trick people, not that we're really trying to trick them, into thinking that your beer has a sweeter, more milk chocolate type characteristic than would without it. Chili is another great addition that's going to offset some of that bitterness. Who doesn't want a Girl Scout beer? Throw some mint in there. I've also done quite a few beers with fruits. Orange and raspberry are some of my favorite, but really, anything can be added. Uh, think about the aisle of chocolate bars as you're walking down the grocery store. What would you want in that chocolate bar but in liquid form with a little bit of alcohol? Another ingredient that's added to stouts as well that I've had a lot of experience with is coffee. We've already got some of those characteristics from our malt. Why not boost it a little bit and actually pull out some of the nuance that coffee can provide depending on the variety that you choose. You can go earthy, nutty, fruity, um, and this can really give another depth of flavor to your beer as well. And then there's always the oysters. People always ask why anyone would have added oysters to a stout, and it actually has a historical background. Oysters were, were very economical, a cheap food that people could get at the same time that they were drinking stouts and porters to sustain themselves. But with the growth of cities and overdredging of oyster beds, we ran out of oysters. And so it became a very high luxury item in chop houses and fancy restaurants all over Europe. And then that continued into an idea of why not mix the two well-paired foods into one beer, giving you a beer that's going to give you a little bit more earthy, salty characteristic. A fun thing if you're willing to get outside of your box just a little bit. So we touched on this a little bit, but when do you add some of these ingredients? Uh, I primarily am adding them in the boil, in secondary, or in my bright tank. In the boil, I'm going to be adding things like lactose, any extra sugars, honeys, to sterilize them as well as ensuring that they're dissolved into my wort. If I'm using chocolate chips, I will also do the same thing and make sure to pre-dissolve them and then add them so that they don't just fall to the bottom of your kettle and burn at the base. With nibs and husks, I like to put them in the boil or secondary 
The boil, you're going to extract a little bit more of the bitterness from those, so make sure that you take that into account when you're writing your hot bell. Definitely also put them in hot bags. I made the mistake once of just throwing them straight in and completely destroyed my heat exchanger. So protect yourself and anything that will not fully dissolve, just soak in a hot bag in your kettle. For secondary fermentation, I like to put a lot of my fruits in or any spices or herbs that I'm using. When you do it this way, I find that you're not blowing off a lot of your aromatics through your CO2 production in primary fermentation. You can run the risk of having a re-fermentation if you're adding fruit, but that can be something managed or an exciting new process. If you want to truly avoid that, add all of that after your beer has been crash conditioned or even in the bright tank. But keep in mind, once your temperatures are colder, it's going to be harder to extract those flavors, so you'll get a milder, a little bit more mellow characteristic, which may be what you're going for. All right, so we've talked about malt, we've talked about where stouts came from, let's talk about actually making one now that you hopefully have a recipe developed. So we're gonna start with water. Water obviously is 98% of what we're doing in beer, so it matters pretty significantly. Some of us are very lucky and we live in places that have clean, fantastic water. Other of us, not so much. So my biggest recommendation is to use the resources that are available to you. Contact your city, get a city water profile. If you cannot do that, which you should be able to, go get that water tested somewhere else. And then from there, you can base all of your recipes, not just stouts, on that water profile and add the correct salts and whatnot to get what you're looking for. There are fantastic resources out there. Brewers Friends is a website that has all types of calculations and things that you can use. They have a target water profile and mash chemistry calculator that you can use with that data that you've received along with what you're looking for to find out what salts and things that you need to add to your water to get the profile you're looking for. I'm a little bit biased. I live in a city where we have absolutely phenomenal water and I also love testing with our base water just as it is without adding anything. Something that you could consider depending on your brewing style make the same beer with your traditional water profile and then with additions and see if anything changes. One thing with brewing darker beers, roasted malts will drop your pH of your mash. Ideal pH in my mind is between 5.2 and 5.4. Sometimes with a lot of roasted malt you can drop below that and to balance that I use bicarbonates to make sure that I'm within that range. So something to use in that brewer's calculation. Also, adding salts with magnesium, um, magnesium sulfite and calcium chloride are going to be very, very beneficial for your yeast health in the long run. So not necessarily to change your pH or your water profile, but to help your yeast health later. So now that we've talked about water, let's talk about actually mixing that water with the grain that we've decided on, mash temperatures. I'm going to focus on single infusion mashes. Uh, I think it's a simple way with stouts to go and uh, will give you very, very good results. Let's get into the science of it. We've got two enzymes that actually make the sugar from starch that give us the needs for our yeast. We've got alpha amylase and beta amylase. Alpha amylase is going to operate at higher mash temperatures, 153 to 156. Beta amylase is going to operate at those lower temperatures, 143 to 152-3-ish. And so depending on the style of beer you want, we want to activate those different enzymes. So the reason for that is alpha amylase chops our starch molecules into very complex sugars at those higher temperatures. 
beta amylase is going to chop our starch molecules into very simple sugars that are easily digestible by our yeast at those lower temperatures. We obviously want a mixture of both, but depending on the type of stout you want to brew, we need to focus on those temperatures because it will have a very big impact on your final product. So if we're looking at mash temperatures and trying to decide that for a recipe, we need to figure out what we're looking for. If we want a drier beer, like a dry Irish stout, we want those lower mash temperatures so all of those fermentable sugars are available to our yeast. If we're looking for something like a sweet stout or an imperial stout that possibly could be aged in barrels and we need residual sugar, we're going to be looking at higher mash temperatures. And when I say lower, I'm talking about 148 to 150 higher 152 to 154 and you're going to get different dryness and mouthfeel from each of those depending on what you're looking for in your beer. All right we're going to talk about hops. They're not that big of an importance in stouts but they do play a pivotal role. So hops in stouts can give your beer a lot of depth. We need that bitterness to balance our malt sweetness but we also need to make sure that we're not overdoing it. I'm going to warn you, this is my soapbox. I hate IBUs. I do not like to use them. I don't tell people what the IBUs of my beer are because there are a lot of different types of bitterness. Perceived bitterness is not part of IBUs. Roasted malts will give you a significant bitterness in your beer. So when you start to calculate IBUs, to calculate what hops you're using, please do not just look at IBUs because the IBUs are not going to balance that roasted malt bitterness. We really need to think about what we want from those hops. So I traditionally use a 90 minute hop edition, a 30 to 45 minute hop edition, and I love to add a whirlpool or flame out edition just to give a little bit of complexity to the finish of my beer so that some of that aroma is still there and it's still a beer with hops even though it's a stout or a porter. If you approach it this way, you're going to get a much more complex product and not over bitter things. I generally take my IBUs down five to 10 points based on how much roasted malt I use so that I don't create an overly bitter stout that isn't easily drinkable, like a Guinness. So I like to use hops that have a nice earthy floral aroma over hops that have a distinct pine citrus aroma. I think that that's going to play much better with those roasted malts. So I use hops like Willamette, Tetanang, Cascade, Pearly, Goldings, and when I'm calculating out my IBUs, I can use hops that have lower alpha acids so that I don't overdo it with my bitterness because I'm already using bitter malts. All right, it's time to move on to fermentation. Uh, the biggest part of beer, we can produce all the wonderful wort we want, but yeast, these magical little beings, are what's really going to give us our beer. So a lot of different yeast varieties and approaches can be used for stouts. However, the main focus needs to be yeast health and yeast viability. So when we're talking about yeast health and pitch rates, what we're really looking for in my book and what I rule my brewing life by is one million cells per milliliter of yeast per degree Play-Doh up to 18 degrees, which will cover most of your stouts. Beyond that, I think you should double that up to two million cells per milliliter. The reason why we're doing this is we're not stressing our yeast out so that they produce a lot of esters and different flavor profiles that we've not designed in our malt bill. If we were brewing beers like Belgians or other things, we would want all these esters. But in a stout, we want a very, very clean yeast profile. Nutritional requirements for our yeast is also a main, main factor in how your fermentation is going to go. 
we want our yeast to be healthy, not just from its propagation, but what we're giving it. A main factor in that is how much oxygen we're providing for our wort. I ideally try to target 10 ppm. If you have too little oxygen, your yeast aren't going to be healthy and start the fermentation that they want. Too much, your yeast are going to produce more cell growth as opposed to actual fermentation. So you can cause issues each way. The other things to keep in mind for yeast health is nutrients. Most yeast nutrients are actually just dead, dried yeast that you're throwing into the boil. But you can buy commercial yeast like Superfood Yeast X to add in there. Or I have seen many, many brewers, I do it myself, I just pull a little bit of yeast off of the bottom of one of my harvests and throw it into my boil that yeast is going to provide amino acids, B vitamins, a lot of minerals, pretty much everything that your yeast needs. But in a realistic world, we don't have a perfect fermentation. So giving your yeast a little bit of boost is going to help out in the long run because you may not have the healthiest pitch rate. You may not have the healthiest yeast. You may not have the perfect fermentation profiles. So adding a little bit of nutrient or yeast to your boil, anything that you can do is just setting you up for success. It isn't going to hurt you in the long run. All right, so let's talk about yeast varieties. Irish ale yeast is going to be a fantastic yeast for obviously your Irish stouts, but can be used in a lot of other stout varieties. You're going to get a clean, crisp, dry, product. If you ferment it a little higher, over 68 degrees, you'll get a little bit more fruit ester in your beer. American ale yeasts are going to give you a very clean, highly attenuative beer that doesn't produce very much ester. And then you've got your London ale yeasts that are not as attenuative, but aren't going to really produce any extra esters to add to your fermentation profile. So again, it's always what you're looking for in your beer, but also, as a realistic brewer, what you have in-house to use. The last thing to consider when making a great stout is your finished product. What carbonation level are you going to achieve, or are you going to delve into the realm of nitrogenation? When I carbonate my stouts, I generally like to keep them a little bit lower carbonated than my other beers, comparatively to a pale ale, definitely Saison's. I'm looking at the 2.5 to 2.6 volume realm. Keeping stouts at this volume level allows for the beer to be not as bitey and overly carbonated and a little bit more smooth and enjoyable, in my opinion. Nitrogenation is also another option that a lot of people are going to. There are smaller bubbles, they're going to give you a creamier mouthfeel, but it is a little bit more tricky if you don't have the equipment to do so, and it causes other issues with pouring. However, consumers love it because it really is like a milkshake in a bottle, or can, or a keg. So depending on what you're looking for, all of that should be taken into account. And for a little tidbit of extra information, carbonation isn't just the tactile bubble feel that you're getting from those bubbles. There actually is a chemical reaction from the carbonic acid with a CO2 beer that's going to change how people perceive it and it will be more biting. Hence why more people are going to nitrogenation for some of these beers to eliminate that. However, without that carbonation, you're not going to get that beautiful aroma bursting out of your stout full of chocolate and roast and toffee. All right, so we're now making great stouts. And in my opinion, there's a couple takeaways from this. Primarily, pay attention to your malts. I enjoy very complicated malt bills. When you click on the link to see some of my examples of recipes, the addition of extra malt that you wouldn't normally expect will actually give you a fantastic beer. Bitterness. 
Roasted malt create bitterness. Do not add too many hops and calculate that into your IBUs so that you have a smooth, drinkable stout. Addition of extra ingredients is fantastic. Try different fruits, try different spices, try the chocolate, try the vanilla. It will absolutely change your traditional stout or porter. And lastly, drink these beers and have fun and go get your learn on.